millions of homes. A man loved a woman, a child it was born. It learned how to hurt and it learned how to cry like humans do. I'm breathing in, I'm breathing in. Hi, and welcome to the 196th Tommy Rocket Show. We're here today with my co-host Peter Phipps and popular author and writer Jed Carboni. Welcome, Jed. Thank you so much. Hi, thanks for having me. Well, it's a pleasure. Uh, you know, Peter, this is a great topic that you've chosen. And I'm just wondering what gave you the idea to choose Jed and well, the topic for today? On the table, he's got three books that are out. Uh, Brown and Sharp, which is really the, uh, the history of industrialization in, in Rhode Island, I suppose. Washington, and it's interesting, it's a part of the general series. You have something of a military historian, in addition to being a former journalist, a colleague of mine for years. Uh, but the one that's so deeply Rhode Island, I think, is your Nathaniel Green book. And uh, you, you talk about it as a history, uh, as a biography of the American Revolution. And in Rhode Island, um, we have the Gatsby. Now, no one else knows anything about the Gatsby, right? But I didn't know until I read your book that Nathaniel Green had a sort of primary role in the beginning of this dispute between John Brown et al. and the Rhode Island mercantilists and King George and the Gatsby. So fill us in on how, did, how does Nathaniel Gr get into this story? Well, he, he owned the, the vessel, the boat, that the Gatsby seized that, that, that made everybody so angry. You know, uh -huh. It was his boat. The Hannah was his boat? Um, the, the Fortune. The for that was yeah. the, Right. That was the first incident <laughs> yes. early in the year. Right. When they, they took his boat. Right. And, and, and prior to that time, Nathaniel Green did not give a wit about the troubles between England and America. He was obsessed with trying to marry uh, Debbie Ward out of, out of Westerly. Uh -huh. One of the six young and pretty daughters of, of uh, Samuel Ward. The, the governor and, or the future governor? A governor, yeah. Yes. And so he, that was his, his obsession. You can see it in his writings. But once they took his boat, once the Gatsby took his boat, he became obsessed with the cause. Now, now his first response, unlike Brown and Abraham Whipple, which was to burden it, right. his response was to sue. So, yep. uh, so where did he file suit, and what, what was his claim? In, in East Greenwich, right. and, and the illegal seizure. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the funny thing is, I don't think it was an illegal seizure. I, I think that the Admiralty laws gave England the right to take that ship. It didn't give them the right to bring it around and sell it in Boston, but it gave them the right to take that ship. But the law isn't always what's on the books. The law is what's been practiced, and for a past almost century, through, a, through salutary neglect, England had not been collecting, uh, you know, on a lot of the tariffs for local traffic. So when right. they decided, you know, we're going to um, start making the British North America pay for itself for the money we just heaped on it in the French and Indian Wars, you know, and they said, we're, gonna, we're going to start collecting that while the Rhode Islanders were like, whoa, it's kind of like an absentee landlord coming back and, and saying, hey, you know, that rent, I, I really do want it. And, and well, you know, no, this is mine now. Right. So that was uh, 1772. Right. Uh, and his response was, um, his active response was to form the Kentish Guards a little later, right? Right. Well, yeah, that was um, in response to to um, when the British took over Boston in response to the Boston Tea Party. And, uh, you know, and, and then he looked and he said, oh my God, you know, they have just taken a capital city 
what if they did that around here? What if they come in and take Newport? You know, we we need to you know be ready to uh, resist such a thing. Now, did he arm and outfit them, the Kenish guards? He uh, contributed money. Mm -hmm. Um, he went up to Boston and bought himself a musket, illegally smuggled it out of Boston. Right, I read that. And he um, also then um, was a charter, you know, these militias were, were well organized, chartered by the state. You didn't, just, you had to be a state chartered militia. So he helped get the charter. He had served in the General Assembly, so he helped get the charter. And he also, um, uh, ran for office, right, in, to be an officer. They, 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 unlike the Virginia militia, where, which Washington was a part of, up here it was a very democratic thing. And you, and the, the soldiers chose their officers. Yeah, yeah. And so here's a rich guy, charter member of the organization, he puts his name in to be a, you know, a lieutenant. Mm. They don't vote for him. Mm. They say, no, they, they, the, the, the uh, Bows of East Greenwich all decided that Nathaniel Green, this gimp-kneed, asthmatic son of a Quaker preacher, did not have the right stuff to be a military man. But, could, could have been over right then. But he was uh, eager for war once it got hot in Boston. Right. Well, when word came back from Le about Lexington Concord, April 1775, um, the Kentish Guards were a fairly new organization at the time, not even a year old. And he hears about this, and he's, he's out in Coventry at his at this forge that he was running out there for his mm -hmm. family. He gets news of that, and he gets on his favorite horse, Britain, and he comes thundering in from Coventry to East Greenwich to the, to the Kentish Guards headquarters. And they start off for Boston uh, by foot. He's marching along, and you can see, because he had a, a gimp knee, possibly from running the trip hammer at the family forge. He's, you know, marching along, kind of a little out of step with everybody else, you know. And Governor, I, I think it was Governor Cook still at the time. Yes, I think you wrote that. Says, um, no, I don't, <laughs> don't get messed up in this, boys. Stay in Rhode Island. Uh, Green and a few others ignored him, got on some horses, started for Boston, and then they got word that right. uh, it was. Now later, Bunker Hill, was he there? He was at that time a, a brigadier general under Washington in, in Boston, except he had come home to Rhode Island to recruit for the Rhode Island Army of Observation that was, that was stationed up there. Mm. And this guy who had, you know, months before been rejected as a, as a lieutenant in the Kentish Guard is now a George Washington's youngest brigadier general in, in the United Army of the United Colonies. So what did, what did Washington see in him that, that his fellow soldiers in East Greenwich did not? Competence. Mm. What, what Washington saw in this guy was, was a quiet competence. Uh -huh. um, it, it, Washington arrived at Cambridge in, uh, in July of, of 76, and he, uh, the, the, you know, the, um, the, he found, oh, 75, and he found this, this wide arc of militiamen camped around Boston, like nine miles, you know, 10,000 of them. And he's riding along and he's looking and my God, they were a ragtag bunch, pretty, pretty, you know, unschooled in the, in the military business. But there was one camp that he saw where the streets were properly laid out, the equipage was right, and that was the camp of the Rhode Islanders under Nathaniel Green. Ah. And because Green had been a small businessman in Coventry, he knew how to get, he knew how to boss people around. He, you know, he knew how to get product in, raw, raw material in, product out, how to, how to make people organize and behave themselves. So he used his experience as a small Rhode Island businessman to run a good army camp. But, his, Washington saw but his military training was reading Napoleon's campaigns and things like that, right? Oh, sure, sure. He was a great reader, much to his father's dismay. Right, because yeah. uh, his father you know, was the Quaker leader and, and thought that he, he should only read Barclays and Fox and religious tracts like that. And he's got this son, right, who just loves to read. It would be like if I had a son who loved video games, I'd be like, what are you seeing in that son, you know? He loved to read. His aunt, one of his aunts said nobody could get the substance of a book the way he could. Right. And he read everything. Why? And, uh, you know, a real polymath and curious about everything, including military history. So, so the Americans sort of gave up on Boston. They lost Bunker Hill and escaped, and they moved on, right? Actually, they, they sort of, um, what, what they did was, was 
they brought in a whole bunch of artillery that Henry Knox had taken from uh, Fort Ticonderoga. Right. They set it up on the hills around Boston, and uh, you know, British troops wake up there one morning in, in mid-March of, of 76 and say, wow, there's a lot of guns up there. We can have another Bunker Hill and go try to get them. Or, you know what, Boston's not that important anyway, which it really wasn't. Let's get out of here and go to New York. Oh, so, <laughs> so it, was, it was it was the uh, the British who went to New York. They did. They right. said they said you know what, um, they, they, so, and they still in Boston to this day you get St. Patrick's Day off not because it's St. Patrick's Day but because it's Evacuation Day. It's when the British left Boston because they looked up and saw Henry Knox's artillery up on Dorchester Heights and said, yeah, we don't want to live below that. We don't want to take the time of bloodshed to go get it. So let's you know what, so let them have Boston. Now, now Washington thought. New York was the key, right? Right. And why did he, just because of the, it's New York or it's big well, or? Well, it, yeah, because you got that Hudson River stretching all the way up, you know, deep into what's now Vermont, you know, up towards Champlain and stuff. And um, so it was kind of a key, the, what I think John Adams called the key slot to the, to the continent, at least in the, in the north, you know. Anything that was going to move in any quantity moved on by boat. And uh, you know, so it was. It was a, an important gateway to uh, you know the northern interior part of the but, country. But uh, but they didn't. They didn't do well in Long Island. They didn't do well in the, the American in Manhattan. Side. Right. Oh, I mean, it just <laughs> just went horribly wrong. Right. 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 I mean, it, it, any it, any armchair general could sit down and look at. The, the, what happened there, and, and, and just say, well, that was inevitable, <laughs> you know? And, and the key thing, you're trying to hold New York. It's an island, right? Whoever's got the, the Navy is going to hold the island. And the British had And the British had the Navy. Because the French don't arrive for years, right? Or, right, right, right. No, at the time, you know, the beginning of that war, these now, English subjects didn't Now, if we were to stop the story there in 1776, yeah. by some frames of understanding, that's all Rhode Islanders know about Nathaniel Green's military history. Now, why is that? Living in the North, you get this sense that, you know, th these guys in tri-corner hats popped up from behind the walls at Lexington and Concord, popped off a few rounds, Bunker Hill, and, uh, and Yorktown, and it's over, you know? And uh, I, I think a lot of that is, um, there is an, a Northern-centric view towards the revolution because a lot of the publishers came out of the North, Boston, New York, mm -hmm. and because I think after the Civil War, a lot of the um, you know people in the South weren't real keen on celebrating uh, um, that certainly not the, the northern Yankee parts of the heroes oh, of right. it, that, like right. Green. Right. You know? And I mean, this story of Nathaniel Green, which we will develop, it goes all the way from the Gatsby, the, 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 the first sparks of the American Revolution, all the way through that revolution. And if you include Katie, his wife, which we'll get to, it gets to the Industrial Revolution. All in one short life, he lived, what, 41 years or 43. something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So it's, uh, it's a great story for that reason. It's a great story, and we'll get back to that when we come back for the second segment of the Tommy Rocket Show, so stay tuned. It would be nice if latex condoms were automatic. But since they're not, using them should be. Simply because a latex condom used consistently and correctly will prevent the spread of HIV. Welcome to the second segment of the Tommy Rocket Show. As you know, we're here with Peter Phipps and Jed Carboni. Peter, where were we? Well, I thought we were going to get into the, uh, the strategic importance of a good retreat. <laughs> now, now that that the theme was set in New York. They got got out of New York by chance, and then they needed something dramatic to do, and so it was Washington's idea to cross the Delaware in the middle of winter and Christmas of 1776. Was that his idea? That was his idea. Yeah, it was crazy. <laughs> Washington could be very aggressive, and oftentimes his, he, he would he would call councils of war, and oftentimes people like Nathaniel Green 
could call him back, and but but Trenton, he had made up his mind. I mean, they, you know, after losing New York, getting clobbered at Long Island and White Plains, and losing Fort Washington, and retreating a long slog all the way across New Jersey, across the Delaware, and now they're, you know, they're stuck. They're really pushed up against the wall, right? And uh, it's winter time. They're in the west side of the Delaware River. And the British hold all of New Jersey, hold New York. Things are looking good for them. And Washington's not going to have it. He, he, he wants to rile them up, show the, the continent that the revolution yet lives. So he's got this idea that he is going to move the troops across the Delaware River on Christmas Day and uh, attack the Hessian outpost at, at Trenton. Um, and see if he can't take it and make some noise and just kind of spear it up the, you know, the right. American cause. Yeah. Probably good to raise capital and soldiers. I mean, a, a good surprise victory. And so, but he's not taking any chances. Who does he put in in the lead of the attack? He, Nathaniel Green is the. It takes his regiments, not of Rhode Islanders, but he take he takes his regiment, people he's in charge of, across the Delaware first, and and he's going to lead one of two columns in into into Trenton. Um, so yeah, he, he he gets his people across, and then you know it takes all all night to get everybody loaded up. In, uh -huh. uh, and across, uh, and by the time they get across, of course, you're in this, you've gone from kind of a cold but blue day to a very windy, snowy, haily, crappy, uh, you know, mm. day after Christmas morning. And and uh, and then they attack all these Hessians who were sleeping off Christmas, is what it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, no, nobody really expected. I mean, you know, if you're one of the Hessians in your barracks, I mean, they did have uh, uh, some pickets out on duty, uh, and you know, a little bit from camp, and they did fire on, on on Green's troops as they come, you know, walking down the road, but and then they went retreating into Trenton, and by then it was too late. You know, you, you've got, uh, Monroe's got his cannon set up, and Knox, you know, raking the main street, and Green's coming in, and they, they had him. I mean, you're sleeping, thinking you're pretty safe. You hear the gunfire from the pickets, you come running out into the street, and already the cannon's blasting down the street. There's nothing they could do. <laughs> right. And so what's the score on that? Captured, uh, killed? Uh... Um, um, the, and the Americans had non-killed there. Um, James Monroe, uh, future president, did, uh, I think he took a ball to the shoulder, but nothing too serious. A couple yeah. of wounded, right, whereas the Hessians, you know, they, they only a couple of hundred managed to get out. Uh, the rest were either killed, captured, wounded. Now, in that winter, they spent in Morristown. No, that um, they they uh, after, after they drove, they went back across the Delaware that winter yeah. uh, of seventy six seventy seven, and uh, came back into Trenton. Um, had a little skirmish with with um, Cornwallis's troops there, and were kind of again in a, <laughs> between a rock and a hard place, and they found a, a side road to go to Princeton. They came out January 3rd, 77, and attacked Princeton. And they got around Cornwallis, who was flummoxed. He thought he had him pinned down, um, and took Princeton, and then retreated back again across the Delaware. So, you know. But now, that was not the winner of Valley, Valley Forge. There was no, no. Valley that, Forge. So that was, was 77. So there was a year of fighting in New Jersey, and then comes the winner of Valley Forge, right? Uh, well, yeah. Okay. So, so 70s. So that was. They, they took Princeton January 3rd, 77. Um, then much of 77 was pretty quiet as, as Washington and Green are, are driving themselves crazy trying to figure out what the British are going to do next. And finally, um, late in that year, um, late August, they, the British started to move on Philadelphia. They were going to capture Philadelphia. So in late 1777, there's this Which was the capital of the oh, the capital, young, yeah, yeah, and, and and here they come, you know, up, up to Schuylkill with, with with the navy. They're gonna they're gonna take it, and uh, there was actually some Rhode Islanders at a place called Red Bank. The, the first Rhode Island regiment was there, the the, the, the black troops, and. Um, Red Bank was a fort on, in New on, Jersey, on, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that, that controlled the river access 
to Philadelphia, and Washington said, "Hold that for it." And uh, Don, didn't they, you know, they almost did. They, it was, it was kind of like Bunker Hill, where, where some Hessian soldiers came to take it, and they got clobbered by the by the Rhode Islanders there. Uh, but eventually, uh, uh, some British Navy came up, broadside to the fort, shelled it, bam, bam, blew them out of there. Um, and then they success fairly easily after that took Philadelphia. Took Philadelphia, right. and, and so you know. Um, well, I say fairly easily. There was one major obstacle, Battle of Brandywine, right. which was the, the uh, largest in the war in terms of men and material at a pitched battle. You had 25,000 soldiers c combined uh, you know, at the Battle of Brandywine. Less, less of a guerrilla action than many of the others, right? Well, uh, well you know, it, it, there's kind of a misunderstanding that, and I think Lexington conquered, well, that was kind of a guerrilla action, not really a pitched battle other than that little skirmish on the Lexington Green. But most, most of um, all of Greene's and Washington's battles were, were line formation pitched battles. And just that Brandywine was on a huge you fire scale. first and then it's bayonet to follow. Uh, yeah, yep, yep, yeah. This is brutal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was, it was uh, you know, a lot of times it didn't come to bay in that because whoever got the best of the first round, uh, the other time side was, you know, retreating in a hurry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and Brandywine, that happened there, particularly up in the northern part where General Sullivan's troops, uh, they didn't even get formed before they realized the main body of Cornwallis' troops was on top of them. And uh, so they were getting routed back towards Philadelphia. And, um, and, and, and Green was, you know, facing off uh, across a, a river against the, about 5,000 troops, Hessian troops. And Officer Washington said, I don't need you there. I need you to come up here helping out Sullivan. So Green managed to move his men um, uh, very rapidly, uh, uh, you know, he got thousands of men to move uh, at, at about four miles an hour to, and, and within an hour get over there and defend um, Sullivan's flank and, and as they retreated from the field of Brandywine. So, so Green kind of helped that day uh, save the American army um, by, by, you know, through his rapid movements of his troops over to protect the, the now, flank. Now, so when does Washington come and say, you're my quartermaster, you got to save the army in Valley Forge? That's that right. winter? Yeah, it was, because after, after they lost Philadelphia, they made another attempt to, um, to sort of make a, strike a blow by, by attacking the British troops that were camped outside of Philadelphia at Germantown. Mm. And there again, uh, Nathaniel Green led one of the, the, the three columns into Germantown almost succeeded in driving the British off the field, but uh, some, some bad tactical decisions made that allows the British to come back. But Germantown was a very important battle in late 1777 because it, along with the victories up at uh, Saratoga um, by, by uh, Gates, showed the French that, you know what, the, the, this force really can fight. I mean, they can stand toe to toe with the British, you know, maybe it's worth um, backing them. So, to so, further so, entangle the British in America. Uh, right, yeah. right, yeah, well, yeah, because, you know, the French were in, involved with, uh, in, in, in Spanish, were kind of fighting the British over some, some something over in Hanover with the German states, you know, so, so, uh, so the French were, like, interested in, and kind of sticking it to the British, particularly, um, and maybe taking over some of their. So, so how did they get so poorly provisioned? Well, that, okay, that, so, that, so after that Germantown, you, didn't you, right. wouldn't you know that Valley Forge was going to be a disaster the way they w way they set up camp? You would, <laughs> um, and Green did. Green, yeah. Green didn't like the, the landscape, didn't like the, the choice of, uh, of a camp, but, right. you know, it wasn't in charge. So after Germantown, um, it's now, winter's coming on, you know, it's late fall, early, early winter. So what are we going to do? Washington says, well, we're going to go up here uh, to Valley Forge. We're going to keep the army together through the winter, and that's what we're going to do. And uh, they get up there in... Um, 
the, the ground was poorly chosen, and then the um, quartermaster general of the army um, was kind of sucking up to Gates and these uh, uh, other guys that were sort of thinking maybe Washington wasn't all he was cracked up to be. He had got kicked from pillar to post in New York and had lost Philadelphia. Who is it? And, and meanwhile, Gates is successful up in Saratoga and Bennington. Maybe they got maybe they're back in the wrong guy. You know? Maybe Gates is there. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. so and so Mifflin becomes part of the, these guys in in. in and, and because he joined, takes an official government position, he resigns as quartermaster, which is the best thing that could have happened, because he had basically quit the quartermaster duties anyway. And quartermaster is a very important thing. I mean, that's the person who makes sure the army doesn't starve, doesn't freeze to death, stays dry, you know? And he had kind of abandoned the job, and they were out there starving to death and soaked and cold. And green. And, and so then Washington, you know, when they need a new quartermaster general, he turns to Green and he says, I want you to be my quartermaster right. general. And Green says, doesn't want the job. No, he, he wants says, to be a general. He says, nobody's ever heard of a quartermaster in history. Right. And, uh, but, you know, he takes it. And once he takes it, he throws himself into it whole hog. And again, his experience as a forge owner in Rhode Island, where he had to get raw material in and product out, well, he says, what do I need? I need roads that carriages can roll over. We've got to repair some roads. I need carriages that will roll. I need, the oxen I, were getting stuck in the mud. And right. And, and I, I need harnesses that the oxen won't break through. I mean, so let's fix things up. I have magazines with food out here. I just need ways right. to get them. So and that logistics job. He does it well. Right. And I think most people know that part of the Nathaniel Green story, but yeah. I think it stops there. And what we want to get to is the fact that, in fact, when I read this the first time, I never knew it. He, he was considered the savior of the South. He was. Yeah. yeah. And you can explain that term when we come back for the third segment of the Tommy Rocket Show, so please stay tuned. <laughs> Forget it. Forget it. Next time, don't forget it. And every time, make it part of the relationship. A latex condom used consistently and correctly prevents the spread of HIV, the virus that causes AIDS, and may save your life. Welcome back to the third segment of the Tommy Rocket Show with Peter Phipps and Jed Carboni. Peter, where are we uh, with the Southern Campaign? Well, we left Green as the uh, master organizer and the saver of the of the Continental Army and Valley Forge, and then um, Washington sends him south. But he's the second man to Gates. Is that what it was? No, no, uh, you know he was not the second man down there ever. Um, what what happened is, you know, after Valley Forge, right? He, I mean, one out of five guys who went into Valley Forge never came out. They died in their starvation, whatever. But they come out in May of 1778, much stronger than they went in, and in. In um, now the the, Na the French Navy comes has pledged support, and Washington gets word of that, and in, in, in at Valley Forge in May of '78 is so happy he orders a few de joy where they all fire their muskets in a long running line to honor the French, right? And so the Br the British get bored of this too, and they say, "Darn it, they're going to come try to take New York. We better leave Philadelphia and go back to New York." So to do, so they're moving their troops from Philadelphia to New York across New Jersey. Then Washington, Green, the, they all come out of Valley Forge. Uh, a much better fighting force than they've gone in because Baron von Steuben had tr taught them the, the, you know, the manual of arms while they were there. And so they start chasing the British across New Jersey. They catch up to them in Monmouth. There's a big pitch battle in Monmouth where they stand toe to toe. It's kind of a draw, you know. Um, but it's a big pitch battle where the American fighting force showed pretty good. In, in, uh, and then the theater of the war turned to Rhode Island, where the, where the British were occupying it. And there was a big pitch battle on Rhode, Rhode Island when Nathaniel Green led the right side of the American troops and Lafayette led, led, the, led the left side. And then uh, that was almost it for battles in the North. You know, there was one more in, in 1779 at Springfield, New Jersey, that Nathaniel Green uh, was the commander of. Um, 
And then after that, like it gets strangely quiet in the north. And because um, the king himself actually came up with this th strategy, and not if it didn't almost work, he figured, I can subjugate the south. I mean, he figured correctly that the, 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 in Georgia particularly, but also South Carolina, North Carolina, the, the revolution didn't, didn't have the support. It had in Virginia North, you know, Virginia was also a big hotbed of the revolution. But he figured, if I can cut them off from the south, from their commissary, I can win this. So the king moves the theater of the war to the south. Right. And this is like 1780. So he sends Cornwallis. His Cornwallis is there, yep. He's in charge down there of a huge garrison at uh, Charleston. Um, in May of uh, 1780, the British took Charleston and the largest loss of men and material in the war. Um, so they got Charleston, they got Savannah, they got this big chain of outposts throughout the Carolina backcountry. Up, up the rivers, they had forts, right? Yep, yep. And so they've, they've got the Carolinas, Georgia solidified. Um, in August of, of 1780, they, they decided to send Horatio Gates, you know, uh, down the hero of Ticonderoga. Uh, right, right, Saratoga, yeah, to go down there and, uh, and route him out, you know. And he goes blindly staggering into, um, Gates's strategy was kind of like a poor poker player who always goes all in, and sometimes it results in significant plots. And oftentimes. Go bust. Yeah, yeah. At Camden, he went bust. Yeah. yeah he got clobbered at Camden. So he lost the entire American army in August of 1780. So he didn't have that, that ability to know when to fold them. As, right, as right, say, right, right. Exactly, exactly. And so, and, and so they'd lost the, an army in Charleston, May 1780. They lost this one. They had already lost an army in Savannah. They'd lost three armies down south. So Congress— now, so An army is a group of regiments, is a what? What is an army in this? Yeah, exactly. It, it, you, you've got, you've got your, your regular troops, you know, continental troops and service regiments of them, um, plus whatever militia you could scare up at the time, and you got it by handed to you and lost those men, the material, mm -hmm. and— how much of that could you stand? By 1780, I mean, Lexington conquered is five years ago by now. It would have been five hard years, bloody years. People were getting sick of this. And then in September 1780, who turns out to be a traitor but the great Benedict Arnold, right, right. you know? So that's kind of like the nadir of the war. Right. And, and the Congress turns to Washington and says, look, we picked the last three generals uh, down south and— yeah. Why don't you pick the next one? Ah. Washington says, well, I'll choose uh, the thing to green. He's yes, been okay. So That's where I got the story mixed up. Yeah. yeah. So he goes down there in December 1780, and he gets to, um, to Charlotte, North Carolina, and that's where he finds Gates. He's surrounded by what's left of his army, you know, these— So, so uh, let's set the stage on what Nathaniel Green put in charge to save the South. Right. And he comes to Char uh, Charlotte. Yeah. Not uh, and what's he what's he find? What what does he what's what does he have to deal with? What's well, he got? What when he he sends an adjutant around to get a count on on what he's got left, mm -hmm. and the adjutant comes back and he says, well here, you know, sitting in camp eating food, you have about fourteen hundred men. He says of those that are equipped and fit for duty. I mean they have clothes, they have weapons and they're not sick, you've got about 800. Nothing. you got about 800 men. Now, what about militias? Can he— he, well, yeah, he's going to want to be drawing into some, some militia, but, you know, militia, uh, like anybody, sometimes, you know, you're looking at— uh, Who's winning? <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm not going to flock to your standard if I'm just going to go get clobbered. Um, and the, but the, there was uh, a, a battle at Kings Mountain, South Carolina, be, between some militia groups, the Over Mountain men from the American side and under the command of Patrick Ferguson, some loyalists, and the, and the Over Mountain men, like at Kings Mountain, kicked some butt, which did spirit up the, the militia to start to say, 
well, maybe, you know, maybe we... we, so, we so what does Green do to try to turn the tide with what he's got? Well, so he looks around, you know, and there's, and there's Cornwallis 50 miles away with 4,000 men in the field. And I mean, he held them as a five to one. Train, oh, arm, and and yes, provision. Yes, and he's got garrisons at Savannah and in, and in uh, Charleston and in the whole back country. He's got almost 10,000 men. The Greens 800 equipped and fit for duty, hmm. and Green's job is to get rid of the, all these people, right? Yeah. So the first thing he does is he splits up his force, which Napoleon later said, "Divide to live, unite to conquer," which is what Green did. But at the time, people were like, "Why is he doing this? He's just now exposing himself to defeat in detail, where they can roll up two smaller armies, right?" But he takes his best guys, bow about 800 of them. Um, and, uh, and uh, those 800 that are equipped and fit for duty. And, and he puts them under, under Morgan, uh, Dan Morgan. And he says, Dan Morgan, you take these guys out to the western part of the state and just show the people out there that we exist. We're, we're still going, you know, try to get some people, some militia to flock to your standard. And I'm going to take the rest of these bozos, and we're going to go down on the PD River to an isolated place, and I'm going to try to, you know, make soldiers of them and get some weapons for them and some food into them and see if we can not make soldiers of them. So that's fine. So Morgan takes his group, and he's out in western South Carolina, and he writes to Green, and he says, man, this com company country is war ravaged. It won't feed our horses. Everything's eaten. I want to go down to Georgia. And Green considers it his request, and he says, no, I, w I want you to stay out there. And uh, Cornwallis sees this detachment, and he— He's 800. Uh, yeah, he, yeah. Uh, yeah. And he sends his best, uh, about 2,500 men on the band Tarleton and, and his cavalry to, to go chop them up, and it looks like a no-brainer. And then Dan Morgan um, it, it has just an ingenious— tactical battle plan where he where he lures Van Tarleton's cavalry, cavalry and, 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 and some infantry up into a little place called Cowpens. Mm, uh, I and, saw that in and, the book. Yeah. And he's got the, you know, and he's got the broad river at his back so his guys can't actually turn and run, right? And he, and he lines them up in an ingenious strategy. In three, three lines, basically. Three, three right? lines. He puts his rarest militia in the front and tells them, all I need from you guys is one shot and you can run home and kiss your wives and sweethearts. And then he tells his second line, when you see those guys running back, don't panic. It's part of the plan. You know, and, uh, to keep that and then at the top, he's got his best regulars. And, uh, and by the time the, the, the British got up there, um, they, they were ready for him. And in fact, there was kind of a mistaken command. What some people thought they were being told to retreat. So the regulars started to retreat. And then, then you know, Morgan's like, no, I, I don't mean you to retreat. It's a turn around. So they turn around, and the British thought they were retreating and kind of you know, yes. put their head down and, and started start yeah, running yeah. after him, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden they turned and blam, and yeah. they blew him out the field. The cowpens, right? And so you know, with the, with the recent victory by the militia at Kings Mountain, and now this out of cowpens, um, it's, it's almost like when the you know when the Patriots were down twenty eight, and there was a strip sack fumble, and you got a little bit of a maybe. Those Patriots, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, right. and, yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and they won. Right. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, so uh, Nathaniel Green and Tom Brady have something in common. Here. Oh, a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so, but but then he moves on, and then he has all these tactics of snipers along the road, and yeah. And well, the, there again, that, that, not so much guerrilla snipers. He did. He, he now. There were a couple, like Sumter, um, you know, Thomas Sumter and, uh, and Francis Marion, who were militia captains or militia commanders who were into that kind of guerrilla warfare. Green tried, in Sumter's case, just about always unsuccessfully, to get them to participate in more line formation pitch battle tactics. Um, but when he realized, in particularly something's case, that they, they really weren't going to cooperate, he, he used them as a kind of a guerrilla force. But mostly, he was into pitched battles. What he did after Cowpens was he, he led a, a great retreat, um, which is hard to do, uh, up across the Dan River into Virginia. Uh, he crossed the Dan crossed and left Cornwallis Dan. on the other side. Oh, and Cornwall Cornwallis, you know, after he lost his, um, you know, Van Tauten's 
a lot of Bim Talton's people and, and equipment, Cornwallis res resolved to track Green to the end of the earth. And, and he just uh, burned all of his baggage wagons, drained all his rum into the sand, and, and so he could travel light and fast and started chasing Green. And Green led him on this, really the 1870s, uh, 18th century equivalent of a high-speed car chase, right, as they're running back. This, and if Green gets caught south of the Dan River with an inferior fighting force that, that's on the retreat, he's going to get clobbered. But he gets across the river. He gets across the river. Uh, so, but then, so the battle turns to the Americans. Yeah. Um, uh, the word comes out that, that George is petitioning for peace. And Green keeps fighting and marches into Charleston, right? How does oh, well, not, not quite exactly. You got a little bit more to go, and, and so, it, you know. So that, that was early 1781 um, when he comes back. You were talking about militia. Yeah. He, he he recruits militia in Virginia, and they come back across the Dan River, stronger than they had been on right. the retreat. And he basically invites Cornwallis to attack him at a place called Guilford Courthouse. Yeah. And Cornwallis makes, presses the attack at Guilford Courthouse. And, um, and it's uh, one of those Pyrrhic victories for, for Cornwallis where, yeah, he drives Green's troops from the field, but he's very much bloodied in doing yeah. it. And so now look what he's got. He's lost the, that legion that under Tarleton at Cowpens. He's lost a bunch of men. He's far from his supply line now down in Charleston because he had chased Green way the right, up towards right. Virginia and North Carolina. So he says, man, I got to get over to the coast to get the heck out of here. So he heads to the coast. And then Green, rather than follow him, makes the strategic decision to turn his back to a superior foe and press back into South Carolina. To all the Carolina. river, so, the river Yeah, fortresses. and start picking off all of those forts right. along. So we're setting up Yorktown. Oh, yeah. After yes. the break, Tommy? Yes, after the break, yeah. which we'll come back for the fourth segment for the Tommy Rocket Show with Jed Carboni and Peter Phipps. So stay tuned. I'm out here every week talking to people about sex. My message is simple. If you're going to have sex, a latex condom used consistently and correctly can help prevent the spread of HIV and other STDs. People out there got to understand. That's why I'll go anywhere to talk about latex condoms. Even into your living room. Hi, and welcome back to the fourth and final segment of the Tommy Rocket Show. Peter, where did we leave off here well, in three? we're in the swamps with the snakes along the... <laughs> The Sauté River, is it? Yep, he yeah. was there. And, and Green is setting up the ending, setting up the conclusion that we all know of in Yorktown. But so, so why does he turn his back on? on well, he's picking, he's picking off all those posts that, that, that they'd had out there, him, him in, in conjunction with some of his guerrilla people like Sumter and, uh, uh, and Marion, and, and, and also with some of his cavalry. And, and, and he, well, not so much that, but he picks, but he, he decides he's going to take Camden himself, and he has a, a battle outside of Camden on Hobkirk's Hill where he gets driven off the field, and... You know, it was, for a second, it was maybe his first chance to actually win a battle and drive the enemy off the field, but he realizes, I can't risk my whole army. So he withdraws, and he, after the battle of Hobkirk's Hill outside of Camden, a post in the Carolina, South Carolina backcountry, he writes to, to Lafayette, amongst other people, we fight, get beat, rise, and fight again. Mm. And that was kind of his strategy, you know? Right. And uh, so he— and We he, fight, he, get beat, and rise again. And we fight, get beat, rise, and fight again. Oh, I see. And, and, they, and so he—and he did rise again, rose again at Utah Springs, and again had a battle. And, and that one, he pretty much did hold the, the field at the end of the day. He, he claimed a victory after that one. And that really was, you know, driving the British back into, into Charleston. So they only had like one minor 
camp outside of Charleston at Orange, and, and Green had taken over. He, he, he sent the general into Savannah. He had taken everything. And, and within nine months of taking over command, mm. he, he had them driven back to basically a wind garrison in, in, uh, in Charleston. And he also predicted, uh, he's got Corn, Cornwallis had run over to the coast after Guilford Courthouse and then gone up into Virginia. And Green sees that and he says, we got him right where we want him. He says, um, what's going to happen is he's going to get out there on that, on that Yorktown Peninsula. The French Navy is going to come in. And he says, we have beat the bush. And, and the general has come to flush the bird. You know, <laughs> the general he, being George. George Washington. And so he and, comes and down. Washington. Now, do the French bring him down, or they does he do. march down? They do. He, well, they did march. He, came, he mostly came by land. But uh, Rocha, you know, New York, Washington made it obsessed with New York since 1776. I mean, here we are five years later. He's still obsessed with New York. And Rochambeau is like, uh, George, no. We're going, we're going down here. Yeah, and, it, yeah, and to his credit, you know, Washington realized that Rochambeau knew what he was doing yeah. and, and was willing to listen. I mean, Washington was the titular commander at Yorktown, but Rochambeau, he knew how to do siege warfare. Mm. And he's, he and his French officers were the ones right. that were in charge of that siege. Washington was taking notes, you know, executing it, lighting the first fuse as they, you know, blew artillery all into Yorktown at the, where, where Cornwallis was bottled up with, uh, you know. And the British fleet was blocked by the French fleet. Right, right. There had been a naval battle out to sea that decided that. The French came back in. In fact, uh, some, a French fleet from Newport slipped in be, behind them and, and started the first, you know, had the, brought the first uh, kettle mortars and things like that to set up the Oh, to your, on your time. Yeah, yeah, on yeah. your time. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, and now, and you, now here's Green, right? He's down there outside of Charleston where it's miserable, right? He's got this army now that isn't fighting every, a lot anymore. They're, they're in malarial swamps. And it must have been very tempting for him to say, I want to go out and be part of this man, mm. you know? And, in, he, and he had it within his authority to do yeah. that. But he didn't, but he was strategically smart. He said, I don't want to withdraw from here, give more troops up there than we need, and allow the British to come back and take over all this ground. I mean, when we sue for the peace, that, that it's, land is going to be decided on what did you hold at the time. And I'm not giving up all of this so that I can go up there and be a spectator at Yorktown. Mm -hmm. So he created the conditions. He predicted the conditions mm -hmm. that would happen at Yorktown. And then he, so he a, marched into Charleston. So then, he, finally, when the, when the British, you know, after losing Yorktown, are looking around and they're saying, ah, this is not going well, we're leaving, we're leaving Charleston. And Green does. He gets to march victoriously into into Charleston, right. and, and he's now. I mean, he has now rid the South of uh, of the British force, which looked impossible just you know l less than two years before. Right. So so um, there's peace at least until 1812. Yeah, it yeah. starts again. Yeah, uh, and um, and I uh, this this is a little. The French, the the uh, the Southerners, in re in in gratitude, uh, give Nathaniel Green three. You describe them fallow plantations, right? That were owned by loyalists, right? So so Rhode Island gave him an honorary degree of Brown in 1776. <laughs> in, Cal in, in in South Carolina and Georgia, they give him three plantations, right? Right. Uh, yeah, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. And he moves. To the one in Georgia. Mulberry Grove. Mulberry right. Grove, Georgia. So what's that, what's Mulberry Grove look like and what kind of shape's it in? That's not in good shape. I mean, it, you know, as it had been owned by a wealthy loyalist who had, had you know, quite a rice plantation going there. Um, and, but the buildings, of, all the glass was broken out of them. They'd been looted by the locals, you know. They, they, were, they were pretty and much And the labor shells. force is gone. Who's gone? The, the slaves are gone, right? Um, the enslaved people, most of them were, were, were gone, yeah. Yeah. So, 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 right. so now he gets down there and he's got this land, and he, and, you know, and he, up north, he, 
he can't make a go up there anymore. I mean, he's, he, his family had grown larger and larger, and that was a family business, and each one of them got a piece of the pie. It, well, he was gone, and he kind of got the short end of the stick. He got a poorly producing farm in Westerly. Well, they got the forges. So, so he's, oh, he says, all right, I'm going to go down here. I'm going to make a go of it. And he appeals to the Georgia legislature to, says, to say, hey, I want the enslaved people that come with this plantation. Uh, the, I want the full property package. Right, right, including property ownership of the people that, that work it. The slaves. And you're right. And so a, a uh, Quaker um, who knew Green wrote, wrote to him, and he says, you know, please don't become a slaveholder. If you do, uh, the future historians will have to remember you in a different light. I mean, he literally writes that. And Green writes back, there is no defense for slavery. And then he makes a half-baked one. Well, I got, you know, six kids and no property. Now, who and, says there's no defense for slavery? Green, Green acknowledges that? Yeah, he does. But then he goes on and but, talks but about his he, economic yeah. issues. Yeah. And then he goes to, what, Philadelphia and buys 200 slaves, right, or right, something? Right, right, yes. Well, he's there to, for his Boone's Barony plantation. He writes to an overseer and, and says, you know, I want you to buy, you know, good-sized people. I don't, you know, right. and, and yeah, yeah. So he and he, and he also, I noticed in the book, there was an instance where he um, uh, captures a British force that includes slaves that are working for the British, and he offers them as payment to, to the, soldiers to, the, to continue to the fighting. militia. That's right. That's called Sumter's Law. Uh, it was Sumter that suggested it, and, and Green signed off on it. That right. you know, to, that yeah, that people. Basically, you know, who could have been freed? Uh, he, he said, oh, "No, we're going to give you." To You're going to be a bounty, a, a yeah. ser continued service bounty. Right now, that's a hard thing to yeah, get yeah. your head around, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Now he great general, so, <laughs> but his <laughs> finances fine, were yeah. not good. And now talk about banks and the the debt. Oh yeah, so so his so his buddy Banks there in uh, England. He's an Englishman, a uh, textile maker, right? Uh, yeah, he's he's more of a uh, what he was at this time. I don't think he made anything. He was a, a military contractor. He was a broker. A broker. He was a he was a war merchant. A war merchant's a good thing. Yeah, and what he his thing was, you know, he would. Um, Signed a deal with Congress to out outfit Green's troops that were camped outside of Charleston, waiting to get in there. Um, you know, for 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 um, he'd he'd get them the the, the goods. And uh, it was stop saying the 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 cloth was probably made in England. Oh, I'm sure it was. Yeah, it's yeah. and sold by British merchants still in Charleston, right? Right. Well, right? We know how that so, was. But, but that, so the people that own the the, 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 the material, the soap, the cloth, uh, you know, in Charleston, they're like, I'm not sending anything to this to this banks guy. He, uh, you know, I don't trust him. And so Nathaniel Green says, Look, you deal with our contractor. I will guarantee you that you will get paid the money. Thirty. This was this was a bad decision, but it was a bad decision. Because right. And so then he comes after him. Well, right? because, yeah, because Banks uh, takes that money invested in, uh, in plantations in, in Cuba and stiffs Green, right? So Green is now, after the war, on the hook for 30,000 pounds to, to, to English merchants who had supplied his army while it was camped at yeah. the doorstep of Chester. Now he, so he's when, in debt. When he dies in 1786, yeah. is he still— He's still in debt. So how does, how does that debt get cleared? Well, Katie, his wife, Katie, um, she's still alive down there in, in, at Mulberry Grove with, uh, with uh, six kids and, uh, and a tutor, Phineas Miller. Right. And, uh, and, and she's, you know, trying to get the money back. And finally, after a few years, Congress says, yes, we will restore your estate. We will right. give you this, this money. And by then, she's married to Phineas Miller, who was her, tu her children's tutor. And, um, and Miller, was, you know, knew of a guy from had gone to Yale, and he knew of this guy um, Eli Whitney, who yeah, had yeah. gone to Yale. Now here's where the story rockets into the eight, in the 19th century in, in an incredible way. Yeah. So, so, so now Katie's no just sit in the parlor and play the piano, <laughs> right? No. Okay. So, so this is where this is the. It's a beautiful thing when you think about the way it closes. But so, what does Katie and Eli Whitney come up with? Well, okay, so, you know, Katie's married to her tutor in, in uh, a nearby plantation owner wants a tutor, and they say, well, we know this guy from Yale, um, Eli Whitney. So Whitney comes down, 
meet, you know, meets up at Katie's Mulberry Grove Plantation. She says, stay here while you're, while you're teaching next door. And he starts to make some toys for her kids out in her barn. And, um, and he hears a conversation of the local rice farmers, planters, because that's what the main crop was at the time. Uh, if they could only get the seeds out of the cotton, they could really this make green it green seed cotton. Or right, whatever, right. Tough cotton. Right. right. And so, um, uh, you know, Whitney hears about that, and he repairs to Katie Green's barn at Mulberry Grove, and he starts tinkering around, and he's got a, an engine that will, a gin that will take the seeds out, but he's having some trouble running it. And she, she, she hears the trouble, and she says, well, well, try my brush. And he says, you have given me an idea. And he used a, a right. stiff comb. Um, but neither he nor she made too much out of her contribution to that physical invention. But what she definitely did is when she got the money paid to Congress that Green had, you know, been— right. Signed off on. Signed off on. Uh, and so she got that, that 30,000 pounds, or roughly that much, and she was kind of became an 18th century female venture capitalist. Right, right. She She financed— And it was textiles. She, she financed her husband, Phineas Miller, and Eli Whitney, and Miller and Whitney, to, to manufacture right. the cotton engine. So this story, so this story starts with the Gatsby and ends with the cotton gin, all in one— 40, 45 years, right? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, right. Yep. Right. Yes. Less than that. So it's a good point. <laughs> We're talking 20, right? Right. Uh, yeah. Exactly. I was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I hate to be the one to say it, but yes, we've but. come to the end of our time. And I know there's much more we could discuss because there's such history here. And I want to thank you for coming and sharing their information and recounting history with us. Peter, this is your genius to choose this topic, and I want to thank you so much, both of you, for presenting this information to our audience in the state of Rhode Island. And thank you very much for coming. Hopefully, you can come again and share more. Sure, anytime. Thank you both, and thank you uh, for staying tuned to The Tommy Rocket Show. We'll see you soon. Thank you very much. I want you. I want to hold you for hours at a time. I want to talk to you until I don't have a voice. Introduce me to everyone who's important to you, your friends, your family. Look at me. I want to spend my life with you. I'll never hurt you. I'll never lie to you. I'll never put you in danger. There's a time for us to be lovers. We will wait until that time comes.